The World We Create From God to Market by Thomas Bjorkman Read by Mark Meadows Part 3 Going Beyond God, Science and the Market Introduction to Part 3 Now, here in Part 3, we finally arrive at creating our future. But to do so, we need to reckon with the fact that we live in a world of ever-increasing complexity and the pace at which it becomes more complex is accelerating rapidly. The burgeoning complexity is both a danger and an opportunity. A danger because it threatens to overwhelm our institutions and ability to make prudent decisions. An opportunity because it is only in such testing times that we are given the means and incentives for taking substantial leaps into the future. Given the risks, it speaks to our hearts as well as our heads that we can be forerunners of a fairer, more meaningful and efficient way of doing and becoming. But it certainly isn't easy. As global, regional and national interconnections and interdependencies increase, the requirement for cooperation, something we cannot admirably achieve if thinking from limited perspectives and in fragmented fashion, increases too. Complication as a function of greater quantities of connection, and moreover complexity, as a function of more qualitatively different components, structures and networks, all raise the stakes for our civilization. The number of moving parts is bewildering, especially as we discover that the world is more non-linear and chaotic than we anticipated just 50 years ago. Most incisively, our default patterns of thinking are less astutely rational and more prone to bias and tribalism than our cosy rationalist thought perspective would have liked to admit. Nonetheless, we are not doomed to micro-narrative fragmentation and intellectual balkanization, as postmodernism might imply. We face innumerable interconnected crises, a meta-crisis, all while we also paradoxically enjoy the highest standards of living, at least in the first world, ever seen. The disruption that characterises our quickened pace of living requires faster information processing. The quantity of informational inputs across all our systems requires magnified responsibility also. Most decisively, this does not merely quantitatively complicate our decision-making, it complexly adds layers of abstract reality to manage. Thus, while our agency is often already constrained by social, cognitive and cultural deficiencies and obstacles, we are now expected to deal with voluminous tasks of varied types and degrees, all at a faster pace. The tentacles of these struggles also stretch far further, often globally, and are knotted in a Gordian fashion, ensuring even collective actors such as states or regional bodies find solutions to international security, climate change and sustainability not just elusive, but sometimes entirely daunting at their scale. Recent political developments, such as the risks of unhinged populism, arrive at just the time we need more expertise, humility and intelligence, not less. Following the lead of such simple answerers of complex questions risks us repeating or exacerbating the linear errors of planning, even failing to plan at all. These trends and counter-trends thus all serve to cluster confusion, mental ill-health and societal stasis. Hence, we increasingly see and feel a loss of agency and the dangers of potential fatalism emerging. Brexit, the election of Donald Trump and insufficient action following the symbolic hope of the Paris Accords provide concrete examples of these troubling trajectories. Part 3 then takes up the task of addressing these wicked problems at systemic levels, and by building on the rich resources we have gathered from Part 1's history and Part 2's theoretical and empirical appraisals of our systems. Chapter 11. An Increasingly Complex World The rising complexity of modern society has also caused less obvious maladies than global inequality and environmental destruction, which some of the more sophisticated social critics tend to point out, such as lack of meaning, alienation and a lost sense of community, stress and anxiety, life being more complicated and confusing, increasing mental illness, 
and other socio-psychological issues of a high level of complexity and dependent on a multitude of reasons that do not reveal themselves easily with more linear analyses. And recently, we have seen a growing number of scholars warn us about all the new technologies that very soon will be part of our daily lives and completely change how our societies work and even threaten our very existence, such as artificial intelligence and robotics, nanotechnology, new advances in biotechnology, human genetic manipulation, quantum computing, autonomous drones performing a countless number of tasks that may even include that of killing people, and a multitude of other revolutionising technologies that all have it in common that we are yet to figure out how to relate to them politically. The world is changing fast, and if we are not sufficiently foresighted and carefully consider how we shall tackle these changes, it is reasonable to predict that more things will be worse than better. If we are to approach an answer to the question of where the increasing complexity comes from, I would like to suggest these four points. 1. Increased technological complexity. That we have greater knowledge and thereby a greater amount of technology, more tools, which we constantly must relate to. 2. The increasing power or efficiency in technological tools and that they use greater energy flows. This causes the effects, the consequences of technology, to have a much wider scope, both in time and space. The consequences of our decisions thereby become harder to foresee. Think atomic bomb and climate change. We may call this an increased consequence complexity. 3. The increased speed in technological development. Great technology shifts previously occurred over several generations, the human being could more easily adapt. Now, during our lifetime, we constantly have to relate to new technological realities. Think cell phone, the internet, and AI. We might call this a dynamic complexity, that the world changes ever faster. 4. Increased subjective complexity. That we no longer live in a monocultural society where we easily can understand each other's inner worlds and meaning creation. In order to understand our fellow humans today, we must be able to handle many different cultural perspectives, other humans' extremely varying subjective experiences of the world. Symbolic language has enabled consciousness to interact with increasingly complex and abstract phenomena. To abstract means to draw something out, being able to see decisive patterns that constitute that which is most relevant, in some sense the kernel of a phenomenon. So, abstraction for us in this sense moves us closer to reality, not further from it. When the symbolic language has advanced in complexity, people have been able to interact with themselves, each other and nature in a more trenchant way. Therein we have also been able to fulfil more of our needs. And there are now more of us and the distances between us have been reduced, and the exchange of information has become simpler and cheaper, and suddenly we have awoken to a curious, rushing, interconnected world system that is developing in a direction that we are somewhat unclear about. Managing complexity As individual people, we might find it increasingly difficult to handle the new complexity. The world becomes odd, amorphous, contradictory and deeply confusing. This has a string of various consequences. One of the clearest is that psychological health is undermined. This might be a large part of the explanation for the trend of increased anxiety, depression and a host of psychiatric diagnoses. The complexity, quite simply, puts steep demands on our psyches. A world that is all too multi-layered and difficult to interpret makes us hesitant and our inner conceptual worlds are threatened. It is not only we ourselves as individuals that do not manage the existing complexity. It is increasingly clear that our societal institutions have serious problems. We are facing problems of different complexity in our daily lives. Some problems are simpler, some more complex. The same problem can also be viewed with more or less complex thinking. For simple problems, a simple way of thinking is more efficient than a more complex way of thinking. 
we should not over-complexify problems. We do not have time to do that in everyday situations, and evolution has given us a presence for simple and efficient thinking. But often, problems are more complex than they might first appear, and we need to employ more complex ways of thinking than we perhaps usually do. Here, we will focus on the specific aspect of cognitive complexity and look at what different levels of complex thinking enable us to do. The following is based on a model by Thomas Jordan and Pierre Anderson from Gothenburg University that, in a simple and perspicuous way, ranks different levels of thinking on a scale from 1 to 4. 1. The Category Level the category level is the most rudimentary level of cognitive complexity. Here we perceive problems and other phenomena separately without any notable reflections on their possible underlying causes. Our awareness is limited to concrete occurrences and it is mainly these we react to, have opinions about and want to do something about. Let us, for example, look at the problem of city centre vandalism. At the category level, we may become frustrated and angry about instances of vandalism. However, since we do not see the underlying causal contexts and relationships, our proposals are unlikely to alleviate or influence these underlying factors. To the extent we have any explanations at all, they mostly revolve around the character traits of the vandals, such as lacking respect, a destructive attitude, etc. Yet we do not ask ourselves why the perpetrators lack respect, or why they happen to behave destructively. Since the chains of cause and effect leading to the problem are not part of the picture, the remedies then become narrowly oriented towards direct measures to prevent the concrete occurrence. In the example of vandalism, it may revolve around physical measures such as more robust building materials, increased surveillance and deterring forms of punishment. These actions can be effective but since they are not directed towards the underlying causes, they rarely prevent the problem from repeating itself. It is also characteristic of this level that we do not reflect upon what undesired effects our countermeasures may possibly have in a larger perspective. Such reflections presuppose that we think in terms of more complex cause and effect connections, both as explanations for what has already occurred, but also in terms of possible future consequences. This often results in quite near-sighted thinking. Focus is limited to concrete, delimited matters and problems without closer consideration of more abstractedly conceived prerequisites and contexts. 2. The connection level On the connection level, we attempt to identify and analyse the underlying causal connections when exposed to a problem. On the issue of vandalism, we may seek to find and understand the chains of cause and effect leading to someone vandalising. We then focus on different types of causal connections beyond the problem per se, for instance, how youth gangs are formed and develop certain dynamics, how unemployment and idleness may lead to antisocial behaviour, or perhaps even the significance of absent parents in young people's lives. To the extent that we focus on such underlying connections, we not only direct our actions towards the problem itself, but also towards influencing the causes of the problem. We also try to predict the greater long-term consequences of our actions, not just in terms of what we want to attain, but also in terms of possible undesired consequences. It may revolve around the possibility that increased surveillance and harsher punishment can lead to an escalation of antagonism and stigmatization and reinforce antisocial identities. Another way of describing the connection level is by the term linear thinking, which means to focus on the direct causal chains we can observe and create countermeasures that, in a straight line, direct themselves towards the problem we wish to solve. This kind of one dimensional and linear logic is good at solving problems with well known and well delimited variables but it is rarely adequate when trying to comprehend and solve more complex societal problems, wicked problems such as crime, drug addiction, social marginalisation, etc., that are the result of a large number of intimately connected causal chains, cultural and psychological factors, and other structural prerequisites that we cannot observe in full detail or address directly. 3. 
the system level. The system level increases our ability to reflect on non-linear causal contexts and systemic properties. We now start to question and investigate how society's overall structures, discourses and other societal contexts give rise to a given problem and make it likely to persist and reappear. With systemic factors, we can come to see the wider societal implications of things like political and economic power structures, cultural and religious ideas, norms and attitudes, inequality, levels of trust in a society, etc. The effects of such factors tend to influence the system as a whole, usually in ways that cannot be observed linearly. At the system level, we not only think in terms of concrete cause and effect connections, but also in terms of the system's overarching properties. To the extent we see the systemic properties responsible for the emergence and persistence of various problems, it becomes obvious that we need to change and redesign the system itself. In regard to the issue of vandalism, it may revolve around things such as ensuring young people feel more respected and valued, strengthening their self-esteem, promoting positive role models, increasing their faith in the future, or perhaps even advocating new masculinity norms that encourage pro-social behaviour. Since many of the problems that most urgently need to be solved in modern societies tend to be of the wicked kind, social problems such as crime, drug abuse, mental disorders, etc., rather than absolute poverty and security that need to be viewed at least on the system level, it is no longer sufficient that most of us merely think in terms of linear connections, simple cause and effect. Many of these problems are the result of prolonged feelings of marginalisation, alienation and lack of meaning and have emerged from the way society works on a systemic level. Structural and contextual conditions that only can be changed for the better if more of us develop our cognitive complexity to reach the system level of complex thought. 4. The perspective level The perspective level entails not just an understanding of causality and complex systemic properties, but also that we notice that there are many different ways to perceive and interpret causal connections and properties in systems. At the perspective level, we can reflect upon the properties that belong to perspectives themselves. We can perceive and reflect upon both our own as well as others' way of thinking, compare the properties of various perspectives, and use the different and often contradicting views to gain a better understanding of how different perspectives interact so that we can come up with more well-considered measures. Wicked social problems often give rise to different schools of thought, advocating various sorts of action in accordance with particular perspectives. Sometimes it revolves around pure conflicts of interest and personal power struggles, but often there is simply a considerable disagreement between various camps due to cognitive investment in a particular way of thinking. From the approach of the perspective level, these disagreements depend upon the various perspectives directing attention towards various types of causal connections. Every perspective is specialised in one particular type of causal connection, while other types of causal connection are not brought to the attention. In the case of vandalism, we can see that some people emphasise causes pertaining to weakened social control and thereby unclear boundary setting. Others focus on welfare gaps, segregation, alienation and unemployment. Yet others see vandalism as a result of a youthful search for identity through affirmation from one's peers, leading to group dynamics where individuals seek to surpass one another in crossing boundaries. The perspective level's starting point is that the problem descriptions differ between different actors because they have different perspectives and thereby different types of understanding of the problems. From this vantage point, it is possible to see the differences in the various actors' perspectives as a contributing cause to the problems being handled or not handled in certain ways. How various parties view a problem is, quite simply, part of the explanation for the problem looking the way it does. Making the cumulative perspectives an object, not subject, of a deliberative process to find a new solution thus becomes possible on the perspective level. The following is an overview of the various levels of cognitive complexity. Level of thinking about causality. 
Oops. Common questions. What do we do now? Examples of strategies. No strategy. Level of thinking about causality. 1. Category level. Attention to problems, but not underlying causal relationships. Common questions. How do we avoid unwanted events? What can happen and how do we need to prepare? Examples of strategies. Control, impediments, preparedness. Level of thinking about causality. 2. Connection level. Attention to causation, which explains how the problems arise, but not systemic properties. Common questions. How can we prevent that problems arise? And how can we mitigate negative effects if they occur nonetheless? Examples of strategies. Prevention. Level of thinking about causality. 3. System level. Attention to the properties of the system in which the problems occur, but not the properties of the perspectives used to describe the problems and their causality. Common questions. How can we change the system's properties so that the prerequisites for problems to occur change? Examples of strategies. Strategies to develop norms, social ties, well-functioning institutions, early detection, competencies. Level of thinking about causality. 4. Perspective level. Attention to the properties of the different, own and others' perspectives used to describe the problems and their causality. Common questions. How can we develop our ways of interpreting the world and prioritise the advantages of different perspectives? Examples of strategies. Transformation of systems. If we use this model vis-à-vis -vis an issue such as terrorism and take the attack on Charlie Hebdo in Paris in 2015 as an example, it becomes clear how an all-too-low complexity level is unable to handle the problem. At the category level, we only see things such as Islamist terrorists attacking the offices of Charlie Hebdo. The terrorists define themselves as Muslims and the editorial board defines itself as a satire publication. Concretely, there is hence a need to protect satire against terrorism and Islam and to force Muslims to accept satire aimed at their religion. The solutions are thus likely to include more security measures and surveillance. At the connection level, more variables become visible. There is not just one type of Muslim. There is an Islamist ideology and a peaceful religion. There is a connection between immigration and alienation. There are socio-economic factors. There is a lack of cultural capital that creates intolerance towards satire. There is resentment towards the West. There is too much testosterone and too little meaningful work for young men, especially if they have an immigrant background, etc. The proposed solutions are therefore greater social community efforts, more education, various integration projects, etc. At the system level, we can see several factors and interacting contextual connections at the same time. However, those who carry out the analysis rarely see their own perspectives. The social worker sees how social factors influence each other, but not how psychological aspects also play a role. The psychologist sees how various factors can affect the psyche of young people under certain circumstances and how, based on their age, they cannot handle their rage but not the significance of religious sentiments. The imam sees how a specific variant of Islam destroys the search for context and meaning inherent in the religion, but does not have the necessary knowledge to understand the interplay of social and psychological factors in this, and so on. Society's reply is thereby defined by those who get the task, while no one sees the whole picture. Any of these may alleviate the problem to some extent, but the lack of coordination and mutual understanding between different perspectives can make their efforts less efficient and sometimes even futile. At the perspective level, we attempt to understand the personal perspective of those who react violently and harbour antagonistic feelings towards society. We wonder why a society with so much to offer still creates so much personal and collective anger and so little meaning that young men become terrorists 
and accordingly attempt to find out how those factors and perspectives are connected. Our response thus becomes a string of questions that revolve not only around economic, social and religious issues here and now, but also as intimately connected processes over time. We then try to identify the structural developmental changes needed for young people with immigrant backgrounds to feel hope, meaning and a sense of belongingness in society. The perspective level has a deeper existential understanding of individuals and society and the history of both. We thus attempt to combine the many informed perspectives on terrorism, religious fundamentalism, social marginalization and security measures to find the optimal coordination between these to solve the problem. From the previous discussion, we understand that in a more and more complex world, the ability to understand the world in more complex terms becomes more and more important. The increase in outer complexity in the world will have to be met by an increase in the inner cognitive complexity of our minds. When we look at psychological research on children's development, it is evident we humans go through various cognitive stages of development as we mature. Earlier developmental models about our ability to handle complexity usually ended with a stage corresponding to the connection level. However, today we have good reasons to believe this isn't the final stage of cognitive complexity, that some individuals develop beyond this level during their adult life. Typically, adult cognitive development is understood in quantitative terms such as experiences, knowledge, specific competences or abilities and the like, with the basic assumption that the qualitative or transformative cognitive development ground to a halt after the teen years. The focus has been on the content of our consciousness rather than our consciousness's ability for scope and complexity. But, as we shall see in the next chapter, Modern developmental psychology of today has shown that we as individuals have great variation in how complex a question or reasoning we can handle at a given age. It also proves that our ability to handle complexity is not fully developed at an early adult age, but the ability of our consciousness to handle complexity can continue to develop throughout life. In the same way that it was necessary with a population that could function at a higher complexity level to get our modern society to work, it also seems reasonable to assume that we need a population that has the ability to act from thinking that corresponds to the world's increasing complexity in the global society of the future. We cannot, however, expect that it will happen in and of itself. The development is rapidly complexifying, and if we do not react quickly, we risk the collapse of our political system as well as the entire biosphere. We only have our Stone Age brain to rely on, so the only solution is, once again, to reshape our symbol world in a way that favours a sustainable development. The big question then becomes how we can create the best frameworks for the development of humanity so that as many as possible can act from the higher complexity levels needed. How can we make sure that as many as possible reach a level of personal development during the course of life that makes it possible for more people to develop an understanding and feel for the complex problems humanity stands before? The survival of democracy and of our planet depends upon this. The insight from developmental psychology can be said to amount to a paradigm shift of thinking within the field of psychology and sociology and may very well be the missing ingredient for an overall paradigm shift in our thinking at large. As a result of the increasing complexity, we have throughout history undergone a number of paradigm shifts in which we started to think differently and see the world and ourselves with new eyes. A paradigm is how we collectively think rather than what we think. In this way, a paradigm is analogous to a thought perspective, but not synonymous, since it can also refer to other paradigms than the five thought perspectives presented in this book. Paradigms are constituted by our thoughts about how the world works and how we should best go about trying to understand it. In philosophical terms, our paradigms are formed by our ontology and our epistemology. 
paradigm shifts typically happen when both our ontology and epistemology are altered, and both of these are anchored in our symbol world. This is when our symbol world changes, for example, when a newly dominant thought perspective has prevailed as a result of technological development or new scientific breakthroughs, such as Darwin's theory of evolution or new philosophical insights, or when someone creates great art or popular culture that makes us view the world differently. In 1962, Thomas Kuhn published the book The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, in which his relatively simple observation shook the natural sciences. Scientific knowledge is a fractious process. Research methods are a constant struggle between researchers attempting to debunk each other's hypotheses and results. New knowledge is created through assuming that what we already know does not hold true. And yet there are basic assumptions behind all research that no one questions, for example, Newton's physics and Einstein's theory of relativity, right up until Niels Bohr and others developed quantum mechanics. Sometimes there emerge scientific results that gainsay these basic assumptions, results that should not be possible according to prevailing scientific knowledge. Initially, these are explained away as anomalies, but when results are repeated, the consequences can no longer be ignored and the prevailing theories must be overthrown and replaced by a new, more coherent one. It was this insight with which Kuhn shook natural science Scientific knowledge is knowledge in the present moment. Knowledge is a process in constant development. If we look at the development of the scientific paradigms that have supplanted each other throughout the ages, the historical trajectory, as we saw in Part 1, looks something like this. 1. During the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, both the Bible and Aristotle are questioned, and especially by Newton, the mechanistic worldview is developed. 2. With the steam engine, thermodynamics is one shift away from the mechanistic worldview. 3. Einstein develops the theory of relativity, but still has a strictly causal view on cause and effect. 4. Bohr and Heisenberg discover quantum mechanics, which holds true at atom level, where cause and effect, according to our usual assumptions, are disconnected from each other. Quantum ontology and therein the quantum paradigms that are developed from it, break radically with ordinary human experience of the world. 5. With computers, it becomes possible to find completely new patterns in data, and from there, theories on complexity, networks, chaos and self-organising systems are developed. Complexity theories, explanation of emergent phenomena, allows us to comprehend how life, consciousness and culture have arisen out of matter, and we can start to regard ourselves as open systems instead of merely individuals. All these scientific paradigms define not only what we can understand, but how. They were and are frameworks for how we can understand our environments, and they were developed because the prevailing paradigm was no longer sufficiently explanatory. Paradigm shifts are scarcely easy to predict, and often arrive with bombastic claims that may require equally incisive evidence. The allergens that guard against charlatanism or simple error in disciplines must, when a justified paradigm shift arrives, be combated by insurgents who often do the thankless work of questioning fundamental principles. This is in contrast with usual scientific work, which engages well-defined research questions within the given paradigm. Rather than rocking the boat, most researchers add to it, expanding its hull and following the set course that previous revolutionary thinkers laid down. It is only once a critical mass of evidence has been reached and it has overcome the social struggle of winning over territorially minded and rigorously defensive, for good cause, scientists, that one paradigm can usurp another. Our worldview has for some time been so dominated by the rational thought perspective that it is not surprising it faces a backlash from the post-rationalist, post-modern thought perspective. Similarly, we should not be shocked if the allergies of members of both camps are sparked by our all-too-human ability to read what we want to understand 
and describe the motives we assume our antagonists hold. We are replete with biases, and to pretend otherwise is to abscond from our responsibility to hold them in lucid view so that they can be variously distinguished between the necessary features of our nature as embodied perspectival agents and the unnecessary damaging failures of intersubjectivity that these same predispositions can become. I believe that we are in the midst of such a paradigm shift right now, and that it is propelled by both new scientific discoveries and new philosophical insights. The overarching topic of the rest of this book is thus the potential paths on which such a paradigm shift might unfold. In a complex system, many small quantitative changes can occur over time without any notable qualitative effects on the system's fundamental properties as a whole. A society can experience prolonged economic growth without any significant changes to its governing principles, for example, and a species of animals can increase its numbers for a considerable time without any disruption to the balance of an ecosystem. But eventually, the many small changes may add up and the system will not be able to adapt using the same organisational principles. This will cause a sudden disruption, leading to a phase transition through which the system changes from one state to another, a so-called tipping point or bifurcation point. At this point, the system will either break down and fragment into lower complexity, or find a new, more complex organisational principle that allows the system to organise in a completely new way that gives the system new emergent properties. A quantitative change that at one point did not have any qualitative results can thus at another point suddenly alter the system's characteristics drastically. But exactly when this will happen and what the emergent properties will be can be difficult if not impossible to forecast. How incremental changes to the temperature of water do not affect its fundamental properties of being a liquid until it reaches 0 degrees or 100 degrees Celsius is analogous to the sudden emergent change that can occur in a chaotic system after a longer period of steady development. Before such a tipping point occurs, the steady quantitative changes to a chaotic system do not bring about any fundamental qualitative changes. In accordance with a linear logic, a steady temperature increase simply makes the climate warmer and a rising birth rate simply makes a population larger. Prior to a phase transition, we may thus find linear approaches adequate since they can predict the relevant quantitative changes and since there are no qualitative ones that require a non-linear explanation. A simple definition of linearity is that output is proportional to input. A linear approach will thus conclude that the outcome of an increase of 1% is 101%. There is of course no denying that, but such a method does not account for the emergent phenomena, the surprises that may occur as a result of an increase of 1% at a certain stage. For instance, that a temperature increase of 1 degree to water at 99 degrees will change its state from a liquid into a gas. If we did not know better, a linear approach would simply make us believe that the only change to the properties of the water would that it became a little warmer. From a linear perspective alone, we have no basis to deduce a qualitative change from a quantitative, since the emergent properties of a chaotic system, as mentioned, cannot be predicted from its components in its initial state. There is simply nothing in the properties of water that can tell us that it will boil or freeze at a certain temperature, just as little as there is anything in an individual ant that can tell us it can build ant hills. But until a chaotic system enters a phase transition, and as long as what we consider most important are the qualitative changes that occur, it may in fact appear as if it behaves linearly, that the output, outcome, is proportional to the input. Whatever dynamic qualitative effects this can have on the system as a whole, which the linear qualitative approach cannot foresee, we may account for empirically, since there are yet to be any emergent surprises that have not been observed before, or we might disregard them altogether, since such novelties are likely to remain minor prior to a tipping point. 
So even though the global climate is a complex system that every climatologist knows cannot be reduced to simple linear functions, a linear conception of climate change can appear adequate as long as the most notable effect of global warming is that the climate becomes warmer. And since we already have comprehensive empirical knowledge about the consequences of higher temperatures locally, how it influences harvest yields, flora and fauna, desertification and so on, we may feel convinced that this can compensate for the limitation that linear analyses cannot be used to deduce qualitative outcomes from quantitative observations. But doing so obviously makes us incapable of accounting for any potential emergent consequences of rising average temperatures. An illustrative example is how the accelerating melting of the Greenland ice sheet caused by global warming in theory could lead to a sudden halt of the Gulf Stream when the steady increase of cold fresh water injected into the North Atlantic reaches a tipping point. This hypothesis could not have been derived from a linear analysis. With a linear projection, we can only see how the increase in temperature is proportional with the pace the ice cap melts. Whether that will lead to a halt of the Gulf Stream is nothing such analyses can give us reason to consider and since we have no observations about similar occurrences, we cannot use empirical methods either to prove or disprove the hypothesis, not until it is too late. We do not know if this hypothesis is valid or not. This can only be determined empirically, after all. But the question remains if we are willing to take the risk that it is not. From complexity science, we know that any continuous linear or exponential pattern of development will make a system unsustainable in its present form. Eventually, the balance that keeps it together will break down, which leads to a chaotic process, a phase transition, that will only end when it reaches a new equilibrium, a new and more sustainable state with new emergent properties as a result. An understanding of complexity may not make us capable of determining exactly when this will happen, what the decisive quantitative change will be. The straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak, cannot be determined. But if we adopt the non-linear way of thinking of complexity, it can make it abundantly clear that if we continue to add straws to an animal's back, eventually it will break. We now know that tipping points and emergence are universal properties of chaotic systems and that phase transitions can lead to drastic and highly unpredictable changes in a short amount of time with little prior indication of what might happen. That phase transitions in chaotic systems are sudden events is another reason why the water analogy is suitable here. A water molecule does not gradually freeze. It changes its state almost instantaneously it is either solid or it is liquid. A similar dynamic pertains to many of the states of complex chaotic systems. A view from complexity thus serves as an urgently needed warning that we cannot expect to receive gradual indications about a potentially catastrophic development. Complexity not only highlights the analytic limitations of two linearly conceived analyses, it also marks the dangers of failing to adopt a more complex way of thinking alarmingly evident. Towards a new level of societal complexity. As an interdisciplinary field of inquiry, the principles and methods of complexity science apply to physical and social developments alike. The same dynamics that can be accounted for in the chaotic systems in nature can thus be seen in human-made ones as well. The critical developments that bring emergent orders of qualitative complexity into being tend to occur quite abruptly rather than gradually. The same can be observed in chaotic human systems like those of societies and cultures. As such, the preoccupation with levels of complexity and stage theories that characterizes much of complexity science is not just an arbitrarily conceived method of ordering gradual quantitative changes so that we can discern them more clearly. Rather, by the very nature of complexity science, the way these levels and stages are conceptualized is derived from the logics and non-arbitrary principles of qualitative emergent developments, not merely temporal ones. 
and from the distinct properties each stage of complexity exhibits, they need to be clearly delimited in theory and in practice, indeed emerge in sudden leaps and bounds. Societal and technological progress may appear as a gradual process, though, and to an extent it certainly is. But from a longer historical perspective, it becomes visible that it is often characterized by sudden change and longer periods of stability or stagnation. In evolutionary biology, it is widely recognized that major biological changes do not occur through processes of steady piecemeal increases, but through sudden bursts of rapidly evolving complexity. The same dynamic seems to apply to societal development as well. When new levels of societal complexity emerge, it usually does so in accordance with the aforementioned dynamics of sudden chaotic phase transitions. If we view the transition from a feudal agrarian society to a democratic industrial one in a long historical perspective, it arguably appears more like a marked transformation than a gradual development. In comparison with the many centuries of largely identical, fundamental properties of society prior to this, the transition to modernity seems like an almost instantaneous event. It only took a little more than a century for this level of societal complexity to emerge, starting with the political revolutions in America and France and the industrial one in Britain at the end of the 18th century and ending with the fully industrial societies and universal suffrage in the West at the beginning of the 20th. This emergent phenomenon can be seen as the result of a long historical process stretching back to the Middle Ages or even further, as many historians have done and in a way they are right. But the many incremental changes only added up and reached a critical tipping point that completely changed the fundamental properties of our society during the aforementioned shorter period. I admit it can be hard to see how the so-called long 19th century is a critical chaotic state transition given the seemingly just as turbulent centuries both before and after this period. However, the kinds of emergent chaos we are looking for here are not to be found in the perpetual political conflicts and social uprisings that characterize most historical periods. It is to be found in the qualitative changes to the fundamental properties of societal systems. The societies that emerged as modern at the beginning of the 20th century are vastly different to anything that had existed before and, in terms of their properties, largely identical both to those they would have a century later and to those of other societies anywhere else in the following period. Although economic growth has been staggering since the early 20th century, the fundamental qualitative properties of our current society, market economy, parliamentary institutions, rule of law, etc., are arguably more or less the same. Our society has changed, but it does not differ as much from that of 100 years ago as that of the early 20th century differs from the late 18th century. Our society has changed dramatically in terms of economic growth, technological progress, population increase and so on during the past 100 years, but the changes that have occurred may only be as different as water at 1 degree Celsius is from that at 99 degrees. The temperature of water can have significantly different effects on a human body, but the fundamental property of water itself is still the same. It remains a liquid. Similarly, our current society still remains a rationalist, market-liberal democracy. These are its most fundamental properties. Given the many quantitative changes since the early 20th century, such as the ones mentioned earlier, our society certainly has widely different effects on its inhabitants today, but in itself it basically behaves in accordance with the same overarching principles and self-organizing dynamics as a century ago. However, this may not last very long. For all we know, we might be at a state of 99 degrees and stand before a tipping point at which everything solid melts into air. It has happened before.